All right. Right. Lee, hosted by Louis and answered by Louis. Yeah. What's up, everyone? It's Luke Plays Lead here, and I'm here with the Louis Dowd as well. How's it going? Hey, Luke. How's it going, man? I'm very happy to be here, and we're going to have a nice, uh, nice little doobie here. It'll be fun. Yes, I'm excited. I'm excited. We've, we've worked in the past. We've known each other for a while now. Um, yeah, I got some questions. Hopefully people like the questions. If not, hopefully everything works. Got my camera that yep. I said on my last video that I definitely love. Um, okay, so let's just get into it. We got some questions here. Um, first one, nice, a nice easy one. When did you start playing trumpet and was it your first instrument? No, it wasn't my first instrument. My first instrument was piano. I started that when I was about four. And then uh, drums when I was seven, and then trumpet when I was eight. Did not know you played drums. I think I remember the piano part. That's cool. What? Why drums? Uh, well, I was actually a, mainly a drummer until about fourteen or fifteen. Um, well, why, 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 why drums? Drums are awesome. It's I think sweet. everyone should play drums. You are just hitting I think things. Everyone should play drums. I think it's really important <laughs> for your time. And I think, yeah. And then I think all drummers should obviously play a real instrument as well. Um. <laughs> so true. So true. I almost switched to drums. I started on trombone in fourth grade. And, oh, good camera. And then I, um, I was debating switching it to trumpet, percussion, tuba, or clarinet. I had a, I had a friend who played trumpet, so I played Big trumpet. You made the right decision. <laughs> yeah, I definitely did. I don't think I'd be nearly where I am today with uh, if, it, if I didn't pick a good instrument, fun instrument. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so when when you started, were you like super into music, or is it just like a hobby, or do you not care? Like when I started, <laughs> I never practiced. I was just like, well, my parents made me do an instrument, so here I am. My mother was a music teacher mm -hmm. she was the head of music at the uh, primary school that i attended and um yeah i just started learning piano with another piano teacher my mother was a piano like a classroom teacher and a piano and woodwind teacher um uh my sister played clarinet and then my little sister plays trombone and very musical uh we're pretty pretty musical house and my dad plays uh bass uh, and violin and um they ran a big band for a little while so i don't know i was just always surrounded by it, it was just kind of normal yeah it um, sounds like it how was was it a loud house yeah especially when they did rehearsals downstairs and stuff you know it's cool <laughs> i i um yeah i don't know i did i did i like it yeah of course i liked it i mean i remember there was an <laughs> abracadabra brass book and there was just a trumpet in my house I don't know why there was a trumpet in my house. My mom seems to think this wasn't the case, but I'm pretty sure that maybe like we were borrowing a trumpet. I don't know why, not for me, but I just picked it up and just found the Abracadabra Brass book and just started mm -hmm. reading the, just going through the book on my own. I was about seven. Um, and yeah, it was uh, no, eight, eight actually. I think eight. Yeah, and it was um yeah. Then I got a I got a teacher and uh, and then the rest is history really. But rest yeah, is it's history. A lot, a lot of practice. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of practice yeah, I, we had all these distractions that we have now you yeah know? yeah true uh when did you decide that you wanted to continue music as a career well it's interesting that you'd ask that question now because since i turned 30 um i've had this big spiritual awakening and i've realized that there was no that i wanted to be a pilot like your dad um uh, I was really good career. at flying planes. Really, re yeah, really good at flying planes on a on flight simulator <laughs> when I was about ten. Um, and I had some flying lessons, and it was really cool. But uh, I just I got pretty good at trumpet um, and at the drums, and um, <laughs> went to music school. And when you go to music school and you have all these like hours and hours and hours of practice built into your day um becomes quite um uh, difficult to ever even imagine doing anything else especially when you were good at music school as well right 
And there were some really great players in music school who didn't end up playing music for a living. Um, but I guess, um, I guess I, I guess I wanted to do it. <laughs> I don't yeah. know. I've been questioning all this stuff recently. You know, it's funny you, you should ask. Um, mm-hmm. The question is, when did you decide to pursue music? I uh, there was no decision. It was just we, we just, were there. just went into it. It's just the natural progression of where you were. Yeah, and like when I finished uh, school, I went straight to music college, and then met my wife, who was also at music college, and and that's just that was kind of what it was. Um, cool. There was no, there was no like, right, I'm going to do this. It's just it wasn't for that. There was for I, me. I, I Contrary to that one, I did have a moment I, where I was like, I'm going to do music. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I wish I had a, a better answer, but yeah, I just, just kept playing. And then I remember saying, like, I want to play music, but I, I think it was more that people would have been a bit surprised if I hadn't wanted to do music. It was more that way around, you know? Mm-hmm. I could see that. Uh huh. That makes sense. Um, I was going to say something, but I totally forget what it was. Um, oh, no, I remember. Um, the I, I wonder if, like, my experience where it was just like, oh, I want to do music, and your experience where it was just like a natural progression, I, I wonder if that is a, um expression of the different systems from where you are to where I am, where it's like, you, what year did you have music? Like, what quote-unquote school grade did you, like, do? You went into, like, a music school. Um, Sorry, not, so the off, difference between... The script. Uh, so I have a very... I have a very unconventional uh, upbringing, even for here, um, in the scheme of things. But what I believe, uh, so one of the things I found strange about when I when I went to the U.S. Um, to go and do clinics and things was I I didn't even realize that people didn't take um, uh, like individual one on one lessons. So mm-hmm. uh, the way that it works here is you go to school. There's usually what we call a peripatetic teacher um, that does lots of different schools in the area and teaches one-on-one lessons. And your parents say, All right, I want this. Per- I want my kid to learn X or my kid wants to learn X. How much does it cost? You pay a lesson like you would if you were learning golf or whatever. And um, and then maybe there'd be like a Saturday school or something like that where you go play music in a concert band uh, or in a, in a jazz band or something like that, mm-hmm. um, which you also probably have to pay for. Um, but there weren't, there aren't really, there's not really school bands here. Mm-hmm. So not everyone has to play an instrument. Very few people actually do. Um, and if you... I mean, I guess there, there there will be some high school bands, but a lot of them might be in the private sector. The state schools, I, I'm not from that world, to be honest. When I um, went to school, to secondary school, like uh, year seven, which would be like 11 years old, I went from like a Catholic primary school, uh, state school, and then I got a scholarship to the World's Cathedral School, which is a specialist music school, which of which there are four in the country. And then I went on to a different one in my sixth form. So when I was 16, so the system, then I had like hours and hours of music every day because <laughs> it was a specialist music school. It was mm-hmm. a bunch of crazy musicians um, all playing. And, you know, we had symphony orchestra and we had big band and everything. Um, brass quintets, brass dectets. Uh, I had like three teachers at any given time. So it was a very, very privileged wow. um, situation to have. Um, but, I, you know, it's difficult. So I wasn't really even ever at any point ready to to take all of that on anyway, um, as in mm-hmm. never really mature enough to, to get the get the full benefit from it, um, which I probably would be now, which is a shame. But yeah. 30 years ago. <laughs> well, I feel like that goes for a lot of just when the age people are in school and college, I feel like once you're out of school, yeah. then you're probably uh, mature enough to understand it. Pretty much. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> yeah. Uh, cool. Awesome. Um, yeah, that was on. The, sorry, off script. Um, okay, That's you good. mentioned your wife is. Is she still a professional musician? I think I remember this correctly, but I want to get it wrong. She like. Yeah. Yeah, she's an opera singer. Yeah. Okay. How is what's it like one having two professional musicians in the family, um, and balancing that with 
kids and you know going into that whole world where now you have you know two more one or two more people to take care of and how'd you balance uh you know responsibilities and gigging and recording and also making your album well um again funny that you should ask i think having children spurs on a uh, um a sense of responsibility obviously that um it orders you to get your priorities in check um how we balance it at the moment is generally speaking um i work and she looks after the children at the moment if she has a gig in you know we make we make every effort to make it work with childcare and if i'm not working then it's great um but there has to be a sense you know of, of re- it's got you've got to be a bit realistic about what it is that you need to do and what your jobs are and everyone has their own way of dealing with this but balance is the word priorities is the other word um i don't mm. want to call it sacrifice having children isn't a sac it's not a sacrifice it's only a net it's like a net gain massive net gain it's just it's more just in this world you know i go to work leave the house at five you know don't get back until sometimes 12 one in the morning um if i'm gigging and not in the studio and um it really ruins the um the like the family routine and structure it's it's a real mm-hmm. because then i have to get up a little bit later than i would than i would otherwise do with children and then once the kids are up you're straight into the day it's like she starts working at 7am when the kids get up and then she gets off at 7 p.m. when they go to bed, and then I'm I'm out. So the the, mm-hmm. the crossover is difficult. Um, I don't know. It 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 might be clear that I need to do less of that for the family's sake and more stuff that's uh, that fits in. But the other thing that's difficult is that when you have so many different what I would call income streams, but all relating to the same thing. You know, you you do different loads of different stuff. It's not like going to work nine to five every day. You know, I work today, for example, is 5.30. I leave the house. I'm doing Guys and Dolls. Tomorrow is two shows, same thing. Sunday, I have a gig in Norwich, which is like two and a half hour drive away. Um, and then I have uh, Abbey Road, Monday, Tuesday, you know, where I'm working nine until six. So it, there's mm-hmm. no there's no real, uh, gotcha. like, structure. It's just chaos. And um, there's twice as much chaos when two of you are doing it. But that is why it's absolutely mega important to stay on top of it. Because once it starts to once once it starts to slide, once it's on the hill and it starts to slide down the hill, you've got to grab 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 the situation before it gets worse. It's never been an issue. It's more it's more a case of just being <laughs> as organized as possible. Um yeah. but yeah, priority yeah. is to get Millie singing as much as possible. Um uh, but also recognizing too that for opera singer, their careers tend to start properly a little bit later down the line in age. And we decided to have children young um, in our industry, but not particularly young in the scheme of the last century of people having children. Mm-hmm. Um, but in this day and age, I guess twenty whatever I was seven would be would be young, especially doing what I do. But it, it's difficult to you know you can never plan and you can't really ever know whether you're making the right decision you just got to go with the flow mm-hmm. and see what happens we were really good so you know we just got to make that work but it, it that's definitely very apt that you'd ask it's very much <laughs> at the forefront of my i mean look at my studio it's a disaster and part of the reason <laughs> is I'm, trying, I'm trying to sell like everything so i can start again and i got all my trumpet stuff just like all over the floor because if i got to go to work i just throw it in a bag and go yeah. but i'm trying to do everything a little bit Calmer now and do everything a little bit slower, a bit more deliberate. You know, I've yeah. got rid of my phone, got rid of my phone case. Um, so I, I always remind myself to be deliberate because if I drop yeah. my phone and smash it, it's because I'm not being deliberate. So I'm just trying to be a little bit like this. Yeah, with everything. Yeah. I, I threw my phone the other day and it 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 cracked. It hit the wood wood you frame of the bed. I just I threw it onto the bed and they missed. And it cracked. Well, the screen protector cracked. So oh, maybe I maybe I should be a little more deliberate and not chuck my phone. Um, Simply <laughs> put it down. Um, cool. Well, 
Asfa, that's a great answer, especially you know, we're getting to that stage in life soon. Um, mm. Not that we have two professional musicians, we have two teachers. Structure. So. <laughs> yeah, well, there's um, other problems with that, which is like flexibility and things, you know. Yes. It's, it's, not, it's not always. Everyone has the challenges. It's just about which one you have. Mm -hmm. For sure. Uh, speaking of your album, you, you know, you can say as much as you want or don't want to. How excited are you for it? And how long have you been working on it? Would you like the authentic answer? <laughs> Whatever um, you want to give. <laughs> <laughs> so we recorded the album, the band anyway, in November 2022. Um, oh. Yeah. But how, yeah, to say, kind of wrapping into the previous question, having children and trying to earn a living and having the confidence too to like sort of throw everything at something. And then also to figure out why it is you're even doing it. You know, I went through a period of time, particularly in my mid twenties, and then after COVID, where I realized that I was doing things, I don't know, to sell stuff or to make. And um, I realized recently that actually, I've got to try and figure out how I can, how this album can be used to help people or, you know, um, be just like, authentically me i've been terrified of releasing things that have been perfect in the past mm. you know and that's actually not who i am i'm not perfect but it's very difficult in this day and age so i kind of got stuck on the album because i couldn't bring myself emotionally to work on it with all of the other things that were going on and mm. um anyway the new the first track is about to come out it might be out by the time this interview's out ness and dorma and so that's coming out within the next week so um yeah that will kind of mark the start of this new journey um this new journey of of authenticity and and who i actually am not this uh not this person who's been wearing masks for 10 or 15 years try and prove something so um that's uh that's kind of how that's how excited i am for the album it's like i don't know how excited i am for the album um <laughs> i need to uh I need to find out why I'm doing the album because it just seemed like the obvious thing to do. And actually yeah. I totally overwhelmed myself with the amount of perfectionism that I put on it. And to be totally honest with you, you know, that perfectionism totally kills any sense of authenticity and any sense of life. So I'm trying to take a slightly different approach to yeah. the whole experience and try and enjoy the process rather than, sort of work for the outcome which is something that i've been very much um you asked me a question before we started and you said um is there anything that you would say that you um have said that, uh, that you said in the past that you would now disagree with um you probably asked that question later but i will forget if i don't answer it now because it's just come to my mind but i used to say things along the lines of i'm very much a product guy not so much a process guy um and uh yeah that doesn't make you very happy so it's better to be a process person mm -hmm. um trust the process invest in the process and then um experience the outcome as a um as as a bonus really mm -hmm. i mean the same thing could be said you know if you want to go and try and win a grammy you know why are you what why are you releasing this music are you trying to release music to win a grammy or are you releasing this music because it's a representation of who you are slash you think it might help someone emotionally or like, I don't know, like there's got to be a good reason for doing it outside of just selling. Um, yeah. And if you're trying to win a Grammy with something and you're trying to calculate your way to it, it ain't going to happen because the only reason that something wins a Grammy is because it's, you know, felt meaningful. good. Yeah. Meaningful. And it feels good. And uh, they're not perfect either. Those performances. So, um, and uh, uh, they're not perfect in a mixing point of view either. So, I'm trying to figure out how to get excited about my album. Mm. And that's not to say I'm not excited about it. It's just simply a case of uh, total overwhelm trying to do it and burnout. Um, yeah. Uh, because I've taken on a task that is uh, absolutely gigantic and um, spent the whole first year and a half of the process trying to make sure that I didn't show any of my flaws in the process or in any of the product. So um, it's kind of hindered my ability to move forward with it. But we are moving. 
so it will come out definitely i am excited despite not being a, an outcome guy anymore i am actually excited to like see it out there you know and see mm-hmm. it see if see if some of the music does help people i don't know i've got to change my tune with the whole thing you know because imagine it's, it's a hard shift yeah. to have in the middle of the process it probably yeah it is but it also <laughs> the the music's so good that it that's not like i think it will move people in 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 one way or another um but it's more about my delivery you know and like really start to believe what i'm doing this for is being something else you know i think when you turn 30 you know and you have children especially but like when you turn 30 a lot of different things happen to you and you start to it's it's not a case of trying to find out find meaning or anything that yeah i could see what that looks like straight away but more more a case of uh why a high note like or why a trumpet album like why that over something else so i've got a i have to answer that question yeah and i have the right answer to it um or at least i have to search for the answer because the first album was it was authentic in that i just released stuff as we went like i just yeah oh and this tune now let's do this tune cool we'll do this tune and this put on took my mates over to my flat and blah blah we play and release the tune and everyone goes well that's fine but this one was like hardcore calculated right from the get-go to try and be as efficient as possible with time, to try and be as efficient as possible with money, to be trying to be as efficient as possible with um, videos. And a lot of things went wrong in that regard. And mm-hmm. it was all down to, the, I'm convinced it was all down to trying to calculate, like not a shortcut by any means. It's much more, this next album is much more elaborate than the first. Yeah. Um, but the first one was, I, I, I believe it was authentic. You know, I was a 20, 20 something year old kid just trying to do something. And this time it's like, get out there. This time it's like, oh, I've done that. Um, now let's build on that, but like in a kind of slightly cynical way. So I, I need to, I had to reinvent what it is in my mind to move forward with it. But yeah. Well, I'm, ex- I'm excited for it. Uh, I can tell you that. <laughs> I know it's you gonna be. Me, it, it's gonna be good. It. Like it will be good. It's just. I got no doubt. <laughs> cool. Well, I'm excited for it. That was a great answer. Um, different than I was expecting, but a good. Um. All right. We got people pleaser. Uh, <laughs> coming off of the last question, very deep, very personal. This question may be a little more personal, a little more deep, a little more meaningful. Um. What is the highest note you can play on the trumpet or have ever played? I've ever played. <laughs> so I have this silly little mouthpiece, this El Gato Cat Anderson mouthpiece. Okay, okay. It's tiny. I haven't got it. I haven't got it on me at the moment. It's in my work bag down in the house. And um, yeah, I've played like a triple C on that. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Yeah, but it's it's not it's not use it's not like I use it on one gig and that gig is to be Cat Anderson. So I did okay. one gig on an on an Ellington project, Duke Ellington Are project. You able so. to say which gig it was? When, well, all of them. Oh, like, oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I have to. I just have to be like crazy. Everything's above double high C. But um, oh. but it's only with that mouthpiece. With my mouthpiece, like my. The one I use for, to to be me, P1. like a double high. That's the one, baby. Um, there double he is. E flat. Yeah, uh, double high, <laughs> double high E flat is usually where I where I cut it off because any higher than that, it feels like you know how there's like that break between somewhere around A to C. Mm-hmm. Like after E flat, I feel like it's um, what's that term? Um, What's that term when you, uh, negative returns? What's the word? Um, diminishing returns. Diminishing returns. That's the phrase. Mm-hmm. Um, that makes sense. It's Probably don't need return. it out there that much. <laughs> it's not, not coming up all the time. <laughs> yeah, it's not even a note, really. Yeah, but yeah, there we are. There's, it's there's a sound. Answer, awesome. Yeah. Thank you. I'm sure people love that one. Um. Well, we can continue on a similar track. Uh, when, I guess this kind of goes with some of the earlier question, 
when were you first interested in lead trumpet and was there a player that you heard and you're like that's what i want to do or like oh man that's awesome i gotta do that and why was it uh, so my mom went around this big band she had a uh, 1999 she started the big band mm-hmm. and uh, no 97 and then the big fat band came out in 99 and then i think maybe in 2001 or two um we heard that record. So I must be about eight or nine, mm-hmm. and I, I didn't just start the trumpet, but I we used to just dance around the room to that first album mm-hmm. as kids. Uh, we had the old CD, and then um, as I got older, my mum started to get the music for it, so mm-hmm. I started playing in a big band, and um, yeah, then I just tried to play the music, and, uh, awesome. and so it was Wayne. It was Wayne really, and then. And then there was an album, relatable, I, and uh, yeah, Arturo Sandoval did called Trumpet Evolution, which I then I was given for Christmas. I was given like the play along book for that. Mm-hmm. I tried to play along with that as well, uh, which was fun. And then um, Phil Collins' big band as well, the Studio, was a live album, live in Paris, um, a hot night in Paris, I think it's called, mm-hmm. and. Uh, Dan Fenero only trumpet on that, and I used to love listening to that and playing along with with some of those tunes, mm-hmm. chips and salsa. What... Like so I like playing along right. with that. That's basically what I did was I just tried to play along with tunes. Not that I could when I started, or even up until recently, but uh, it's always well, it's fun. Really, I, I find it more really exciting. The way, it's really the way, you know. And like, yeah, like Wayne and the, and those guys. It was um, I guess maybe I was about fourteen. 15 when i started being able to play lead trumpet in the high school band um mm-hmm. and then I, I joined the national youth jazz orchestra which was when i was about 16 or 17 so that's when and i took over from that when i was 18 so um mm-hmm. and that goes up to 25 and so so that was kind of progression but there was no like one um day there was like one moment really um but yeah. it was around 14 15 i've got a small mouthpiece i got a shoe mastinkovich 1.25 when i was about 16 and that made a huge difference like obviously i was playing a one and a quarter c up until then so <laughs> well that yeah. <laughs> that yeah. would uh that would yeah, do that would help yeah. awesome um yeah well i guess you kind of answered both my next questions favorite well maybe not favorite lead player growing up way better yeah okay yeah Relatable. Um, and was there an album or album or chart that sticks out as the one that like inspired you? Uh, but you kind of answered that. Yeah, there were tons of things. A lot of it was the Big Fat Band. Big Fat Band. Um, at the time. It was funny. Uh, yeah, and then I, I kind of learned everything a bit backwards as well, right? Because when I was in my late eight, when I was in my late teens, I think maybe I was 18 or 19, or 18, I joined the Sid Lawrence Orchestra. And that's an orchestra, a band that plays... Glenn Miller and uh, Billy May, Nelson Riddle, all these old uh, old arrangements, and so I I learned all of that, you know, the Gozo sound world as I got old, a bit older, and and I played in the BBC Big Band and some stuff like that. That where, where we we played that music, and actually that slightly more modern, um, I. Uh, Call it cleaner big band sound thing, the LA mm-hmm. studio sound. Yeah, that wasn't really in London, such mm-hmm. you know, more the semi professional bands that were playing the big fat band stuff. So, until I played with the big fat band, I I didn't really do casual flights. Huge, that sort of music. It was much more, you know, British jazz, and yeah. um, and uh, and then a lot of the, a lot of the old stuff. So, awesome. Yeah, I lot. I remember. How I got into lead trumpet, I was, I remember, I think it was 10th grade, and my grandmother had gifted me $60 on iTunes, and I went up to my my uh, teacher, Mr. Matchett, awesome teacher, uh, and I said, uh, I have $60, is there a lead trumpet album you think I should get on iTunes to listen to over the summer? And he said, Full Circle by Wayne Burr's run. The rest is history. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Ten no, grade you awesome. were when that came out. Wow, that's crazy. I don't know if it came out when I was in tenth grade, but it was on no, iTunes. No, but I mean, how old's tenth grade? Tenth grade. Oh. Uh. What age? 
That's a great question. It's got, I think it's like 17, 16. Wow. I remember when that album came out. I think I was at college. So, yeah. I guess that kind of makes sense. How many years are we apart? Like, I'm not sure I'm 30. 30? I'm, I'm going to be 26 in two days. Nice. Happy Close. birthday to <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you. You know what happened a year ago? A year, a year ago. Everyone else, days sing ago? along, come on. <laughs> um, yeah, I remember that album. Uh, it's amazing, obviously. I, the one I heard most was Plays Well With Others. I got that one out yeah. of school. Um, Classic, I'm getting, to be getting, sure. hold, getting hold of his Getting hold of his first album, quite, You Call This A Living, is pretty difficult these days. But mm-hmm. yeah. Definitely. Um, awesome. Yeah, a year, a year and two days ago. You sent me the "When You Wish Upon a Star" stuff. You sent it on my birthday. So. Oh, did I? Yeah, it's a good birthday. Gift. Oh, um, amazing! All right, Here we go. where I've lost my process, or I just read the word "process." Place. Um, got it. So, some uh, we're gonna go with some more range questions, whether you like it or not. Uh, I guess you didn't really start working on range or. You didn't really do exercises. You just kind of played along. It just kind of happened naturally. Did you do any exercises when you started? Or is it just like, I'm just going to play along with these things and just gradually it, you were able to? I think the benefits of just playing along with stuff rather than doing exercises is that you learn to tongue in the up register, mm-hmm. which very rarely does any of the exercises teach you. They're always ascending. Yeah, I remember you telling so, me that a lot when we started. Yeah, like, you know, coming in on a high D, there's no exercise that teaches you how to do that. So, yeah. um, cold, plump, good, 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 bop, you know, mm-hmm. like that, that's lead trumpet. Just, you just got to do and, it. Yeah. And lead trumpet too, isn't necessarily high it's like up to G's. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. So you know, it's, it's so, a, but, there's a lot more that goes into lead right? trumpet. Yeah. And, and actually more a case of being able to be, have facility to play in that register. Um, over the course of a phrase and articulate the way that you want to. Um, I uh, One of the things that I think I probably did but don't remember doing, and someone reminded me of it this the other day, apparently Maynard Ferguson used to do this, and I know Ryan Quigley used to do this, just play melodies up the octave. You know, like Maria. Mm-hmm. Great. Like ballads. Play ballads all up the octave. Yeah, and 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 you let the musicality dictate the technique to you, it's, and then but that's as children that's how we learn. We've always learned that way, and then it's mm-hmm. only when we become adults that we get completely in our own heads, and um, the conscious analytical fear based mind starts to get in your way of actually being able to improve because you can't let go of your own sense of self judgment. So <laughs> anyway, there's time, mm-hmm. there's time for that. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, over over analyzing and over changing is something that. Probably most people have struggled with, myself included, as we've we understood. I remember one time in the lesson, I was, I don't know what it was, but we were talking in the lesson and I was struggling with something, you know, a double A break or something like that. And you told me to just, he's like, just pretend you're going to play a, a double C, but play with first vowel, which is when I play. I don't know if you remember this. Uh, you're like, uh, slur from C to double C, but just hold down first vowel. And I did it and it was like, to this day, probably the best double A I've ever played in my life. It was, it was fantastic. It was loud, strong, in tune. It was beautiful. Never been, I, you know, I play double A's, but never been able to play it like that again. Uh, yeah. So overanalyze. Sometimes you just got to do it. You just, yeah. you know, you just got to do it. Too easy. You know, too easy with this tree of knowledge world we live in, like all of the, all the internet and everything. It's just so much One, information. Yeah. And our little Page eight of Google. Look yeah. up by exact Reinhardt. We'll get to Reinhardt in a bit. Um, <laughs> Okay, um, I think it's, it's a good answer. I like that. Uh, speaking of trumpet, is there any one thing I know they all they all go together? There's a lot of stuff that goes into trumpet playing, um, but if there's one aspect, maybe you should focus on first before really diving into other aspects. Or like, like if you'd rather listen to a trumpet player with like this one aspect of them is perfect, what would like tone, articulation, style, range? Probably not that one. Um, it's a very good question. I would like to say sound, but I can't. Mm-hmm. Um, and the reason I can't say sound is if you ask someone to work on their sound, 
Doesn't really I mean, what does that mean? Yeah. <laughs> what, is it, what does that mean? You know, we're just going to sit here and play a second line G until I have a perfect sound. Mm-hmm. There is no perfect sound. Um, the answer I'm going to give is a little bit grey, but I'm going to say, because I think that everything comes together, as in sound only comes when concept comes. Like, otherwise, you know, what's a good sound? It's only whatever your concept is of a sound. Mm-hmm. Um, most important aspect of trumpets to focus on before you really focus on other aspects. You have to know what a trumpet sounds like. I know that sounds so obvious to us trumpet players. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> you'd, be, you'd be amazed. I mean, I can hear the nuance in everyone, but only because of the vast number of experiences I've had listening to the instrument. You know, mm. whether I wanted to or not. You know, I've just heard it so much from so many different people. And, yeah, and I heard, remember how the nuances in school are again, and I think it was high school. Uh, we would be doing like a trumpet sectional or just trumpets. And our band director, he would go down the line. And he said, who, who, whose trumpet sound do you have in your head when you're playing? Like, who are you? Whose sound are you imagining? Um, which I thought was a great question because, you know, yeah. I feel like most people in band at that point, probably I think it was ninth or 10th grade, they didn't really probably listen to trumpet including my probably well, myself you know, included, but... eventually that that sound that person becomes you mm-hmm. right but it's kind of a boring answer but it's so important the other answer i want to give is is actually like feel and groove because you don't need a trumpet to practice this you know this is one of the things about being a drummer you can practice independence with all four of your limbs um, and you can sing, which is kind of like a fifth limb musically. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can practice that stuff without the trumpet. And then the only thing that blocks you from being able to access that feeling groove is the conscious mind that is dictating to you how your technique should be on the trumpet. I see this all the time. I ask someone to sing something, they sing it perfectly, like groove wise, feel. I get them to put the trumpet up and they try and play it, and it's all wacko. And um, like disjointed and un un yeah. not unmusical like unsmooth you know rigid mm-hmm. um, lacking fluency and that and that comes down to this is why I say it all sort of comes together is you can't play how you want to play without practicing how you want to play yeah so I think it's way better to allow the music the music to dictate to you your technique than anything else. Um, mm. You know, for example, like, if I'm going to play a phrase like... Oh, boy. Uh-oh. Noise suppression is not letting this through. Is it not working? Noise suppression is not letting this through. <laughs> I'll try one more time. That it sounds it sounds beautiful. Oh, oh. Um, um, I, okay, I get well, I think I get the ju- I know what I can hear what you're playing. Um, yeah. So I think yeah, I, I get the play, style you're of. You're gonna play like that. There's no there's no conscious thought about what that's supposed to be. I'm just thinking. I'm just thinking singing it. So as soon as we can connect our voice to our instrument, the better. Also, there is another thing like to do with like resonance and how big mm-hmm. you are not physically big but like how much resonance you can produce you know i think if you speak like this you know or tight but you know, yeah it sounds probably gonna be a bit like that it's better to try and be resonant in yourself and then the confidence and the resonance will come onto the horn you know a lot like of this that. stuff never thought about that. can't really be taught by anyone you know you need to just know what your priority should be so to see what I mean, like you can't yeah, practice yeah. sound, you know, you you just got to hear something and then let the computer just get you there um, mm-hmm. by getting out of the computer's way. You know, the computer is for listening to the music, digesting it. And sorry, not the computer. The, the mind is for taking the music, digesting it, choosing what you're going to listen to, blah, 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 letting it go in by osmosis. And then this comes out this way. It doesn't come out this way, you know. Um, Mm-hmm. Yeah, good, good answer. I like that. It's uh, always insightful. Um, all right, next topic. I think we'll be here for a little bit. Maybe we won't. I don't know. 
uh, but we'll start with just the base. What are your what is your current opinion on the Reinhardt pivot system? Um, I know we've talked a lot about it in the past. You've had a lot of lessons on it. Um, you've talked a lot about it yeah. in the past as well. <laughs> I think it's all right. Like all right or all right? It's all right. Not all right. It's all right. A-L-L. However, A-L-L. Yeah. <laughs> However, this isn't a problem. This is Reinhardt is unfortunately um, a victim of my own sense of uh, like um, how do I put it? Uh, passionately. Diving into something slightly dogmatically um, at the potential expense of everything else. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, I think it's all right, but it's a system. Mm -hmm. And you have to invest in a system to benefit from the system. Yeah. I can agree with that. Is it like... And I think I had a tendency to to add it, to use it to determine variables and teach by variables and teach myself by variables, which when going on, when, when gone unchecked can dominate your mind when the mind should be focused on music um that makes sense so is reinhardt good for discovery mode uh yeah let me give you an example why i think it's all weird maybe someone in the comments knows reinhardt better than me probably mm -hmm. so i i got into it because um, for my all my twenties, uh, I spent most of my time playing third and fourth trumpet to amazing players, which was an amazing opportunity for me. And I think had it not been for my range, some arrangers needing some of those notes in things, I may may or may not have been on those sessions. But I remember like playing third or fourth trumpet all day and trying to play as well as I could, and then they needed a double C at the end of the session or a double D or something. And it's like, okay, there we go. <laughs> and I was like way blown open and comfortable. Hmm. And it was getting to a stage when, when, when COVID came, where I was getting so infuriated by the whole thing, um, not by the opportunities, but by it never feeling comfortable for me doing that. Maybe it's unreasonable. You know, maybe that's yeah. not, again, not the arrangers, what they're asking is unreasonable, but like just that job is unreasonable, you know, maybe, maybe not. Maybe it's perfectly reasonable. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, But I was like, there's got to be an answer to this. So I went and took a lesson with Crystal Barbara, which is an amazing lesson. And we, we went down the Reinhardt route and he diagnosed me with a problem in changing my embouchures. So we went down the route of uh, the no transition embouchure test. Which basically it takes you play your high C kind of like a lead trumpet player, and then you do you, you go down to the low C and back up, so you make the high C feel the same. And I have a slightly weird embouchure in that my teeth don't close. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have an open bite. My wife is it. Yeah, it's um, I think Kat Anderson had it, and Clark Terry had it. Um, but the. The problem is, is that my habitually I would drop my jaw to play low, because as we go lower, we ah, oh. yeah, and as we go higher, we go e, and those two jaw it becomes habitual. So you go ah 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 ah, you know, like this mm -hmm. goes down to go lower. 
And so I did this dogmatically to try and link the registers, and it worked. My registers were linked. However, my low register was completely destroyed. And I and I got away with it for ages, super uncomfortable, like ridiculously uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Not Reinhardt, but this new thing that I'd chosen to do. Mm -hmm. And um uh I totally lost. I, I couldn't do these falls that I used to do, and I couldn't play loudly without pushing really hard. And I totally lost all of the things about my playing that, you know, it's kind of, it's like, what is enough, right? Yeah. What is enough? And uh, it wasn't enough, what I had. Mm -hmm. Right? So, you know, mm -hmm. um, I seeked something else, and I got burned for it. And so it's been a recovery coming back from there, trying to figure out. And I'm, I'm not blaming. This is a problem. I can't. It's difficult for me to talk about Reinhardt in this regard because I'm not blaming Reinhardt. I think I'm blaming my attitude towards it. But it, the other thing I'd say is that a lot of lead trumpet players have the same attitude that I have, because they mm -hmm. wouldn't get to a stage playing something as ridiculous as we have to do or we choose to do, um, and the things we do to our bodies and the things we do to our minds and the confidence things that we put upon ourselves to do these things we're all the same mm -hmm. in that regard so we and we can all become a bit dogmatic unless we stop ourselves from doing it which i was too immature to do at the time so i went down this route thinking that i'd found the answer to life um and it was really good so i think it's all right but i was sitting in this really dead studio it was COVID, so I wasn't even working outside here. And I was killing myself playing that. Killing myself uh, in this room doing this. It was just dreadful. So I can't, I can't answer the question authentically. Mm -hmm. You think you without... had a different experience with it than maybe other people would? I think if I had been taught by Donald Reinhardt for four, five, six, seven years, I no doubt it would be amazing. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, is that I think the art of, and this isn't this isn't a dig on Chris either. I mean, my lessons were amazing with Chris. I think you know, but it was over Zoom. You know, like, you know, we're messing with fundamental things, and I and the thing that I okay, so the thing I did most when I did this was that I went to my deepest subconscious and I said, I don't trust you. And that's so dangerous mm -hmm. because, you know, 95% of us is subconscious. 5% is conscious. And the 5% is always talking to the, the 95%, but it's talking through trust. So I had a, I was playing fine. Everything was fine. Just difficult to link registers, which was a big problem, right? I, like, I didn't like it. It's a big problem. Like, I'd much rather play lead trumpet all night or fourth trumpet all night. Yeah. Equally happy doing either, but splitting up was really difficult back in the day. It's easier now. It's kind of grown up a little bit since then. But, you know, um, I just said to my subconscious, you were wrong. You couldn't play like this before so i'm gonna fix you so i went yeah. deep into my subconscious and said you're wrong i don't trust you anymore and i didn't have an environment physical ambient environment to test these things properly and i also didn't have the correct mindset when making the changes i was dogmatic um and just like boneheaded about it just yeah you're wrong and I was like, I'm going to break this. And I did. I totally broke it. Um, uh, so I don't know whether it's Reinhardt or whether it's just my approach to it, but I'm very careful about teaching people things that um, they can't um, guide themselves on. Right? I like auto-domesticated myself and then like on the horn and uh, allowed it to become 
I don't know how to describe it really, but anyone that's high skilled at something, um, mean it. There's a sense of fear associated with messing with it. Yeah. And I didn't have any fear. I was like, no, we can deal with it now. So I went in, tried to deal with it, went five steps back, and then struggled to get back those five steps. I feel like I'm there now, mm -hmm. but oh man, has it been a journey? The cool thing, though, is that I'm not really sad about the journey either because it is a journey. And I've learned a lot trying to mm -hmm. figure out how to get back to a sense of feel that I used to have when I played with a lot more freedom and a lot less what turned out to be tension. Um, mm -hmm. so that makes sense. Yeah. You asked my question on the opinion of the right, the right pivot system, and I gave you a, an answer about not being... When we were younger, mm -hmm. before they've committed to a career in this field, that there's nothing to lose. But when you you're, think they should start you're when they're younger. younger. Well, when they're younger, they they can experiment freely. Yeah. yeah. But when you when you have a job, you know what is enough. Hmm. You know, because you the in the in seeking more, you risk more. And that's admirable in in some regard, but it's also dangerous. Um, and it and it you you know you've got to be a bit careful about it. So um, I would recommend to anyone that if you have a system that you followed at any point, <laughs> and you know that it achieved a result that was beneficial to you, then there is some merit in just. Because how many of us have really seen our potential with any given system? Yeah. yeah. You know, when, this is the question that I always have now. When people come up to me and they ask, if they, can I have a lesson on Reinhardt? And then I always say, why? And then they always answer the question with some, well, because, you know, I think that maybe I can play a bit higher and like I should be able to. I'm like, no. <laughs> the reason you're coming, or the reason that you're getting a new trumpet, the reason you need a new mouthpiece, the reason you. It's because you've lost trust. You've lost the trust with your subconscious. You've lost the trust with yourself. So you come into a lesson with me, and what you're really looking for is an answer. But in reality, what my job to do is now to help instill some more trust in the fact that you've been able to do these things before. If you can't do them, then, well, maybe we can look into it. But if you've got something going for you, you know, and, you, and you're seeking something more than, you know, I guess being a bit greedy, right? Like, it can come back to bite you. That's that. That's you know. That's not me saying don't try and get better, but just be yeah. just be cautious with why you're doing something and how you're doing it because the because the the potential downsides are huge. Um, so uh, you know, it's not that dissimilar to having a bike accident and knocking your front teeth out and to relearn. It really isn't, but hmm. it's. No one want, no no one should do that to themselves on purpose. Yeah, you've got to be if you're going to go down a route like this, dip your toes in it first. Don't mm -hmm. dive in the deep end. We'll be Test a bit careful. First and then... Actually, I yeah, I think Reinhardt helped me out a lot. I'm um, figuring some of the big issues I had, but uh, I think having your guidance through it was definitely very beneficial. Um, to make sure I didn't like yeah. go too far down or maybe maybe go a similar path. Because I also very in my trumpet playing career have had a lot of um, self trust issues. Just self and issues it's particularly I've had difficult and, playing lead trumpet as well because of just how exposed you are. Yeah, you can't really have a bad day either. Like you can't have a bad day. That's something I've so what, struggled with. Like how? Yeah, it, how, like I some, wake up and I have a bad day. Like how do I make I sure mean, this doesn't happen on a gig? Well, we all have bad days. It's about minimizing the worst days to yeah. either net days like better. And you know, say I've, I've learned golf over the last year, and and um, I realized that golf teachers don't make you hit the ball better. They make your misses better. Mm -hmm. You know, they make you more consistent, but it doesn't make you better. How you get better is by practicing and hand-eye coordination and. And uh, 
you know, a bit of theory, but really it comes down to feel. It comes down to mm-hmm. trust in the computer. If you only have the uh, target in your mind when you swing, you're going to swing with total freedom. But if you have any trust issues with what your body is about to perform, then you're going to get in your own way and you're going to lose 10 miles an hour in the swing speed. You're going to hit the floor behind the ball because you're trying to guide the ball, the club head through the ball. You're not just thinking about swinging. That's the same thing here. Yeah. Stop thinking. That's what Josh just... Kaufman at one time, I had a lesson with him and he's, I had to, Common phrase, it was a paralysis by analysis, just like completely overthinking, getting stuck in your head. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but it happens to the best of us, right? It's like, because what is enough? I ask the question again. And that there's a there's infinite potential by just following the arbit. Mm-hmm. You know, has anyone ever reached their potential? No. Because then that wouldn't exist. Like potential. Um, mm-hmm. So there's always more of the journey to explore, but yeah. we don't have to be we don't have to be doing it in a secretive, if that's a word, definitely not um, way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So good. Yeah. I like it. it's a it's, it's definitely a hot topic, the Reinhardt pivot system. Um, but I, I I do definitely agree with you. I think it. Done the right way, I think it is fantastic, um, but I think it is also precarious. It could, you could definitely. I think everything's really like that, right? Yeah, but that's true. It's more um, about the situation that you're in. Yeah, I think the main danger with the pivot system comes. Well, there's probably more, but the one that I faced in my experience with it is like thinking I'm four A. I'm a, this is what I am four A, and then just being like, no, that's what I am but then maybe not considering other stuff or you're not sure, like maybe you're not sure if you're 4A or 3B and you know, all all that stuff. And it's just like, there's, there's so bliss. many options to contemplate. There's bliss and ignorance, right? That's why there's a, that's, there's a saying. Yeah. There's a bliss and ignorance. And, and the moment that you have awareness of something, you're then responsible for it. Mm-hmm. So um, uh, it could be easier just to not know. Yeah. Live in, <laughs> live in, live in the dark. It's What's safer and happier. Yeah. <laughs> If it's working, don't dive into it. Yeah, yeah. If it's working, you know, don't don't get greedy. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, we'll move on from that. Unless you have anything else want to say, um, well, you did answer most of my questions here on it. Um, I guess the one I want to ask still is like officer classification stuff. I guess we know what we did. Just like literally just now, answer this. I was gonna say, do you think someone should pursue finding their officer classification, or is like like you just said, if it's working, don't even dive into it. Uh, if it's working, don't dive into it. If you're interested and you think you can self-diagnose, then do that. If you think you can get a lesson with someone, then also do that. And even if it's just to see who you play like, now that's mm-hmm. cool. See other people. I think that helps me. Online, uh, just to see who you play like. And then you can go listen to them and you can hear things that are great about playing, things in their playing that are a little bit more difficult for them because the, each classification does have traits and flaws um, yeah. associated with it. So, um, I think that was yeah. very fortunate on my end. I think very luckily, I, I don't really believe in luck too much, but um, like being taking lessons with you, I think I, obviously I don't, I don't want to say this the wrong way. I don't play like you. I'm not nearly at the level, but I think my, the way I'm set up is in some way similar to you. So it was very fortunate that I, you know, got to take lessons with you and yeah. watch you play and listen a lot because it helped me yeah. uh, a ton of my playing. Different ideas off each other too. It's really interesting. Yeah. Uh, we, good, good lesson dynamic. I always enjoyed it. Um, <clears throat> all right. What are some things we've talked about this in lessons before? Are there any things or what are some things that you believe probably most trumpet players are doing wrong or it's like at a beginner level, it's pretty commonplace to teach this, but it's maybe misinformed or didn't teach it all together. Everyone's playing equipment is way too big for them. Well, yes, I, I, I think we've talked about that. Yeah, that's, I agree. It's just too large, too big a mouthpiece. I think that was yeah. the main one we've talked about. 
yeah, it's huge, you know, it's like, um, and also like, what we need to be teaching is freedom like on the horn, freedom to express yourself. You know, the exercises are really important for facility and I, there's so much music out there. I just yeah. I sort of just think the exercise in music. Um, so I think from a material point of view, like how much material you have to work from, then yeah, exercises are really handy. Etudes are really handy. They're great. Mm. Uh, but there's also tons of music out there, you know. Um, I would, uh, I would be, I'd be getting people to play as much music as I could, um, mm -hmm. and I would be exploring how small mouthpiece they could go. Yeah. I've I've That's witnessed cool. some young trumpet players who on bigger mouthpieces are just on a uh, bigger to like to them like a, like a five seat. They're all on a huge mouthpieces. And it's just everyone like, is on a huge mouthpiece. Everyone. Yeah. No one is on anything smaller than a seven C. <laughs> That's what I started on yeah. seven C. Yeah. Um, especially at that age, it's like a, well, I think we started. It's not a bad grade. mouthpiece. It's not a bad mouthpiece, but like these kids are small and they got small lips. <laughs> Tiny. I go figure. Also, if you tell them that that's low C, that's middle C, that's high C, and then you tell them yeah. to play high harder, working it into their mental already. It's like this is high, this is hard. It's bad news. Bad news. I, I, I again, I talk about my schooling a lot because I think I had a, I had a great uh, music program growing up. Um, I remember them telling us like if we just didn't. Like, if we didn't have even the staff, like, if we just, like, taught students to play, like, didn't show them that the third space C was higher than the, like, middle G, mentally, and we didn't call it high C, mentally, they probably would not struggle as much with it, or at least they probably wouldn't put as much effort in trying to play it and mess up that way. Um, not that we should, I don't know what we should or shouldn't do, but I just, yeah. I remember that analogy, it's like, remove the staff, remove the words high and low, and uh, they'll probably won't struggle as much with it. It'll just be another note on the horn that they can play. Exactly. Um, awesome. I like that. Uh, breathing. This is something, this is a personal question for me because um, I feel like I've struggled with this a lot in the past. Maybe other people are as well. How do you approach breathing in and out of concert? Well, probably the same, but what's your, do you have a process for, like breathing or do you just kind of do it? I think Wedge that there's a, a good breath and then there's not, then there's not good breath. Mm -hmm. It's so difficult for me because I think I was taught to breathe well when I was younger, but it's not, you know, <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not sure. Like my wife taught me a fantastic opera breath where you breathe into your back. Yeah. And you expand like a barrel into costal muscles. And it, it, you can hear it in my voice when I do it. Hello, hello, hello. There's no tension in my voice, but I'm full yeah. compared to the classic chest up. Hello, hello. <sighs> like there's immediately tension in my voice as soon as it gets there. So the air is like desperate to get out. Yeah. Hello, 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 hello. And only when you get closer to the pressure point, um, where the internal and out external pressure are the same, um, mm -hmm. uh, the air is under a lot of compression already, a lot of tension. Yeah. Do we need that much? You know, you know, I. Oh boy. You know, like, am I really, am I really going to breathe under that much tension to play hide and two second movement? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I overcomplicated this for a while. I think that there is a better breath than another breath. Breathing is the back. Go look at some opera breathing. I think they have the best breath. Always silent, always warm air at the back of your throat. Yeah, warm air at the back of your throat. Silent breath. How you do it, whether it's through here or whether it's out, whatever, just whatever. But breathe for the music. 
Mm-hmm. Don't overcomplicate it. That's what my uh, Drew Fennel, my trumpet teacher growing up, always told me. Breathe according to what you're about to play. Yeah, you, it, there's not that much to it. If you're going to play really high and now the tendency, you, you'll find that you can overbreathe too, right? And yeah. Cause other tensions unnecessary. So, yeah, that's my personal awesome. breathing. I Do you have any opinion simple. on wedge breathing? Um, I've, I think I've go take a lesson with Bobby Shu. Go take a lesson with Bobby Shu while he's mm-hmm. still about and, and able to do lessons and all that sort of thing. Go and do it. Um, it's awesome. Um, I don't know too much thing. about wedge breathing. I just want to hear your opinion. I don't. I, I I I've taken lessons with Bobby and I I know a little bit about it, but I don't, I'm not I'm not an authority on it. Mm-hmm. Um, put it this way: there are some people that have completely designed their entire playing around it. And they're way better authority to it than I am. So awesome. good answer. I like it. Nice and simple. I, I I would rather you went and searched them out. Um, but do I think it's necessary? If you build your playing around it, then maybe. Mm-hmm. But um, I've heard some amazing players that I use guess, it. I guess the question so, is: Do you want to push or do you want to release? Hmm. And the cool thing about the wedge breath is that it creates a huge amount of tension in the air without then actively needing to press the air out. Hmm. You know, it's just it. there. Yeah. It's just there. Um, as opposed to where you, it's requiring a bit more active engagement of the core. But yeah. less is usually more. With all these things, you want a tight sound, then you, you're going to over, you're going to overdo it. So you've got to be conscious of that with everything. Mm-hmm. But I'm not an authority on it, so I like it. That's yeah. a, I think that summed it up well. Um, okay, as another one for me because I something I struggle with when you are in is in concert, like you're in the in the moment performing. And you have a difficult section coming up, whether it's in like, you know, four measures or 10 measures, or maybe like it's the next, you know, in this song somewhere. Do you do like, how do you mentally prepare for something? Because I have an issue if I'm like, all right, this, this thing that I've struggled with is coming up. And then I like overthink it. And I struggle. Do you have any tips, advice on something like that? Tom Walsh was telling me about, I think it might have been Morris Murphy who said this. When we're in the studio, Tom doesn't open any of the music. Because he knows that he'll either be able to play it or he won't. And 99.9% of the times, he will be able to play it. Mm -hmm. So what's the point in psyching yourself out? That's a good point. What, like... And that's that's not to say don't prepare. Mm Mm-hmm. But if there is no time to prepare, like is so often the case with what I do, because we just go to work and read. Mm-hmm. Why psych yourself out? All you're thinking about is the piece that you've got to play in. Yeah. Just try it's to be coming. a more zen approach to it. It's coming. Cool. I think a lot of it is down to expectations too. <laughs> like, Nobody ever died after someone played the wrong note. Or at least you hope that's the case. Not that we know of. Yeah. And like we're it. we're not perfect. So yeah, it's true. I think coming to terms with that. All you yeah, well, it's been a big thing for me. All you can do is do your best. You can't do you shouldn't be trying to do more than your best, and you should definitely shouldn't be trying to do less than your best. But um by psyching yourself up, you're trying to do more than your best. Mm. Because you will get the best result if you just do your best. There's a little bit of a weird a weird yeah. saying. As you'd say, well, why don't you try harder? No. Trying harder doesn't work. Trying your best works. Mm. And you'll see the you'll see your potential much more if you if you take some expectation off what it is that you're trying to do. And um don't need to worry too much about drilling absolutely everything all the time. Um, mm-hmm. 
if I know something's hard that's coming out, oh, yeah, the case is usually can I play it or not? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and if I can't, if I can't play it, then what's the point of getting wound up about it? Yeah. I mean, maybe I'm in a position where if I can't play it, you know, this is where sort of imposter syndrome is a is a big deal. It's like, well, someone else should be able, someone else should be in my position. Yeah. But they're not there. Mm -hmm. You're there. You're there. It needs to be done. But also, I think a lot of people forget this, and this is something I'm again I'm I'm dealing with at the moment is that we all think that we'll compare ourselves to other players. Um, but a lot of the time, you're actually there because they want Luke, mm. not because they want a generic trumpet player. And sometimes it's difficult when you're subbing because you're there instead of someone who you know should be there. Yeah. But they're not there. So really what they have and what they want is Luke, whether they like it or not. Or whether they know it or not, I should say. Whether they know it or not. Yeah. So, Be with all that in mind, yeah, you just, you just gotta, you just gotta play it. Mm -hmm. And Even it if it happen. Mess, then... If it doesn't, if it doesn't happen, that's really the hard one. You've got to go read some sports psychology, man. You go read some golf mm -hmm. psychology. You know, read some putting mind stuff like you'll realize that you're you're not seeing your potential if you i'm guilty of this like way guilty of this if you allow previous misses to be in your mind yeah. you've never a note that has to be your mindset you know you and you have to almost lie to yourself about it right you mm -hmm. kind of got to believe you can't split it or that you can't miss this phrase then you'll give it the best shot that you can. And when you do miss it, you forget it. Mm -hmm. It's about forgetting the misses. They would say uh, that about putts. Yeah. You, you forget the you forget, forget the putts you miss, and you remember all of the crazy good ones. Kids do it. Mm -hmm. Kids are hitting golf balls, right? They're, they've probably got 50 balls, and their dad's standing there. And they're hitting ball after ball after ball, and they're all bad, bad, bad. Kid doesn't get annoyed, bad, bad. And then he flushes one, and he turns around and goes, "Daddy, daddy, daddy, look!" Mm. And then they remember that one, and then they go back to it because they want to feel that again. Bad mm -hmm. shot, bad shot, bad shot, bad shot. Flushed it, daddy, 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 look. Yeah. And the problem is, is that society nowadays tells us to, and, and sc schooling is all about this. It's like. No, you didn't do well enough there. Do better. You know, they mark, they grade you, whatever. And it's, yeah. it's all about overcoming problems and then doing better next time. Hmm. It doesn't always work out like that. So if instead you can remember all the things that you did really well and then print those into your brain, you will do those things more well, more often. Hmm. But if you fixate on the things that you need to do better then you're all you're doing is fixating on the negatives yeah so if you, you come out of the gig and you if you come out of the gig and you get a little notebook or something and you write down all the things that you did really really well on that gig and forget about the things that didn't go so well yeah it won't happen overnight but your mind will start to have a different relationship with the trumpet and with what it is that you need to do mm -hmm. be more positive outlook rather than only think about the negatives. Yeah. Like yeah, fixating on negatives is fixating on. We're the only animals that punish ourselves over and over and over again for the same injustice. <laughs> Every other animal, they just they they get their fight or flight. The lion's chasing the deer. The deer runs away. The deer stops. The lion hasn't caught up. The deer's hidden, and then the adrenaline goes down. The cortisol goes down, and they go back to normal. And what we do is we just replay it over and over and over and over and over and over again in our heads because we're so terrified of it. And we mm -hmm. keep bringing that cortisol adrenaline back. The note hasn't even happened, and you're getting psyched up. <laughs> I, that's that's my issue. I'm, I'm psyched yeah. up two measures ahead. I'm like, oh, you, you, you think it's your issue? It's everyone's issue. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's everyone's problem. You know? Yeah. It's confident, and that's confidence real confidence. Confidence is quiet, really quiet. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Confidence is concentration and quiet. Most mistakes happen because of concentration, like 95%. And one of the big problems in today's society, too, is that a mistake can happen because of a lack of concentration. And the person who made the mistake doesn't even realize that they were thinking about what toilet roll they're going to buy later. You know, they're, mm. they're not thinking. They didn't even realize that that was what they were thinking about. They didn't realize that they were thinking about the third player being annoying. Or they didn't realize they were thinking about the drummer dragging. They didn't realize that they were thinking about the conductor being annoying. They, they didn't realize they were thinking about this. So when something goes wrong, they blame their method or their technique. Mm. And it wasn't any of those things. It was simply their concentration. Yeah. Um, so if you psych yourself up about something, there's literally no way you're ever going to see your potential on that line you need to play, ever. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I say that with not a huge amount of um, fixing it necessarily, other than to keep, you know, to fake it till you make it. Mm -hmm. You have to retrain your relationship with that stuff. You have to be confident. And I guess the more work you do, the more numb that gets. Because every piece of work that you do means less in the scheme of things. In you know, you're in your early twenties and you're thinking about starting your career. Every single opportunity is your last opportunity. You've got to nail it. The pressure that you put on yourself yeah. to fulfill this dream of being a trumpet player. I can't mess this phrase up. You know, I mess phrases up all the time. Everyone splits notes. <laughs> It happens. You know, you've got to laugh at it. It's difficult. You've got to laugh at it. You go mm. play golf, man. You'll, you'll see what I mean. You go play golf. You hit a ball, go in the, in the trees. You can throw your club up and down like a little child. Or you can, um, you know, you, or, or you can laugh. Mm -hmm. you, get, you can get another ball out. It happened. Yeah. Did it again. Or, Try again. Or, what I would argue is, is put that damn driver away and get out a club that you can swing with a cocky swing like a really confident cocky swing and see that ball go straight in the middle of the fairway yeah it's not as far as the driver would have gone but what we're really trying to do is we're really trying to build confidence with every shot that we do on the golf course we're trying to build every shot has to lead to the next shot of confidence 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 so that when you get to that putt you're feeling confident it's the same thing yeah. with the trumpet man Build confidence. If a warm up gives you confidence, do the warm up. If the if doing something, you know, with your instrument, putting valve oil on it, or I don't know, something material like that, like if that gives you confidence, do it. Anything that gives you confidence, if practicing gives you confidence, do it. If looking at the music and psyching yourself out takes confidence away, don't do it. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> True. I like it. Confidence. Confidence is key. I think it's a. It's yeah, something that probably like everyone that. struggles with. Oh, yeah. All right. I like that. That's, that's a good answer. I'll, I'll try to be confident next time something like that yeah. comes up. Um, all right. We're going to change gears a little bit here. But I wanted to talk about what is your... Oh, we'll start with this. Your YouTube channel. What was the motivation behind starting it? None. None? Just put some songs out there? Yeah. No, I just um recorded myself really for myself and then I just put then someone told me to put them on YouTube. And then obviously then we then we tried um then we made some bigger productions. Mm -hmm. it was really I was gonna fun. ask what is uh it was for fun, that was what's the motivation behind switching to like production rather than Well just I think that. we could. Yeah. You had the you know I I knew the guys and I knew what I needed to do. And I knew how to do the audio production side of it and end up doing the video too. But it's opportunity to learn, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and I guess a bit of show, showing off, of course. But like, <laughs> Always a little bit. Yeah, but, 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 not, but, not, but no more than just being excited about it. Yeah, yeah. That makes sense, yeah. Um, do you have anything planned for YouTube? Is your album going to go on it at all or...? Well, I'm at a crossroads with everything at the moment. The album's True. going to go we on YouTube before, before um, I might just go right into YouTube. Maybe I've missed the boat. Who knows? Um, 
the future's online. But I'm yeah. also realizing that the more I do things out of pride, the sadder I am. That makes so sense. Yeah. emphasis has really got to be on altruism. So I need to think a little bit about how I can help people online with the horn or with music or something. I need to figure that out. I don't know how it's going to happen, whether it'll happen, how to make that happen. But the emphasis mm -hmm. has got to be different to just pride because pride's bad. Pride's not um, good, pride, yeah. No, but you don't even realize that that's why you're doing things. You're, mm -hmm. you're being proud of yourself as in, you and know. The gift given to you. Yeah, possibly. I mean, it's made me question why I'm even doing any of this. So I don't know what is planned for YouTube, but every okay. time I try and force something, it feels bad. Mm -hmm. So I need to find like a sense of structure, which we've discussed is difficult in this working environment. Yeah. Try and and with young children, it's particularly difficult because every moment that I have at home, I'd rather be sort of with them mm -hmm. while they're not at school. But I guess, yeah, without putting pressure on myself, which also doesn't work, like, I'd like to do something. <laughs> Sorry. I'd like to do... No, 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 it's pressure I put on myself. You don't, need to, don't, you don't have to worry about putting pressure on me. Like, when I get this place sorted out and I turn this room back here into a little trumpet sanctuary, maybe I'll make some videos that, that can help some people. Mm -hmm. that's what i want to try and do next so we'll see yeah um, on the uh, I've got some ideas. subject of pride i want to go back to that real quick um i find in my personal experience uh if you're doing something to be prideful generally one that's when overthinking comes in you start overthinking because you're like i want to i want to do this to show everyone how good i am uh i think generally that's one just uh, overall bad bad way of thinking um Pride, uh, we, as you said, pride is very dangerous, not very good. Uh, and I find I probably mess up more if I'm trying to be prideful rather than a different sense of like if I'm going into something in this past, the past gig I had where it's some stuff that I really wanted to play well. Um, I found that I was wanting to play it well. Obviously, I want to play it well. So, you know, there's always a small part. It's like I want to do well. I want people to hear me. I want people to know my growth. But I find I do it better if I go into it. It's like I want to do well so that I can go to Louie afterwards and be like, man, that G-sharp, I nailed it. You know, make someone else proud, you know, someone who else who has invested time into me as a person or a player. If I go into something wanting to do it for, you know, other people, I find it I have a little more success with that. That's nice. So it's, I want... Still pride. Still pride. Maybe a different form? I don't know. Still pride. I want to make. We're all trying to figure out. Well, I, it's made me. <laughs> it's made me question the whole the whole entertainment industry. To be honest, like, what are we doing other than distracting people? Yeah. You know this clickbait nonsense. <laughs> I, I there was a golf instruction video that I uh, instruction person that I saw the other day, and it couldn't have come at a more apt time, really. And I think a lot of people are feeling this right now. Um, he's a great instructor, Scottish guy. And he put a video up and it was titled, I, I can no longer do this, dot, dot, dot. And he was like talking about how, you know, he's put up 1,200 videos and he's not got the recognition that he wants, blah, 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 blah. And he kind of concludes at the end that he is going to keep putting videos up, but he's just going to do what he wants. He's not going to try and fight the algorithm. He's not going to try and... Um, mm -hmm you know compete with others he's not going to try and do this try and do that you know because this is the problem he gave up all of his pga coaching things to pursue youtube and the problem with that is that it has to work mm -hmm. and when it has to work is when there has to be an element of pride because yeah. you have the out, it has to outcome. It can't just be. So you then start thinking, well, you know, you become envious of other creators and things like that. So 
Um, mm-hmm. I don't want to think like that anymore. I used to force stuff, found myself forcing, trying to control stuff. Oh, so tiring, man. It's so like, it's so unauthentic. It's so tiring. You know, someone mm-hmm. might say, well, you can, you know, you know, you can sell that, you sell that, you, know, you got this, you know, you could be making money doing it. And I'm like, yeah. My friend but and I talk about that. What? They're like, you can do why it, why am not I not getting... charge for it? Why am I not getting up every morning and just doing it? Well, yeah. it's something that doesn't feel quite right about it right now. So I need to mm-hmm. figure out where I'm at with that. It's also very much at ends with being a professional musician because yeah. you're taught pretty quickly when you get into the industry to self-deprecate <laughs> and to stay quiet. Absolutely. And not, you know, your personality is, you know, it's not, you know, you're part of a, so it's, it's not, it's not really compatible in that regard. Mm-hmm. So I'm just trying to find the answer, you know? Um, yeah. Some people, it comes really natural to them. They just go straight into it. And I think I speak pretty naturally, you know, but like, I don't know if I've ever been quite open enough until now to just go and be me on there. Right. Without having to like, look at all this glossy stuff, like just go be me on there. If people might like it, but that yeah. requires a lot of confidence. Yeah, I agree. It, it, it takes a lot of confidence to just be yourself. And I think like you're very awesome. good on yours. I think you're very good. I think you're a good host on, on this sort of podcast too. You're just yourself. <laughs> Thank you. I try. It's very important, man. Like not a lot of people have the, have the, uh, yeah, have the confidence to do that. So thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. I appreciate. I try to be authentic. Normally, you know, my last video with the it was just my, I put my phone up and I started recording. I didn't really have a script or anything, but I I like the dynamic of it. I was just to say what I want to say. Um, yeah. You hear my Some, cat? Most people like it. Someone, and you could live with absolutely, them. absolutely. And there's always, there's always going to be people that don't like what you're doing. That's okay. I, yeah. I, I, you know, I'm fine with that. If you don't like my stuff, just click off and billions of other videos out there. But uh, yeah, all right, um, good. I like that. Um, I've said that like a billion times. What is your so favorite? Like I like it. I do like it. Okay. Um, <laughs> do you have a favorite? Song you've done on you, I guess, from your album. Do you have a favorite? Either probably Bridge Over Troubled Water or Game of Thrones, but really only just the last 20 seconds of Game of Thrones. It's, uh, it's so cool. So good. The, build, the building section at the end, I remember speaking to Callum about that and saying, mm-hmm. just like, I don't, I don't know, like, it's not even in Game of Thrones. <laughs> can, you write, can you write something that like builds and builds and builds and builds? It's so cool. I I I remember. I don't watch game. I've never watched Game of Thrones. I'm not like I'm against it. I just just haven't watched it. Um, but I remember not clicking on Game of Thrones, your Game of Thrones video for a while because I was like, I don't, I'm not gonna recognize it, whatever. And then when I clicked on it, and we were hearing the ending, I was like, oh my goodness, this is like one of my favorite things he's ever done. I just I don't the even end know is the end is so cool. I need to I need to so clip good. the end. I need to clip the end and put the end out because a lot of people won't get through all the nonsense. Won't before, get through it, but the end. Is- Cool. It's so good. Uh, that's a great answer. I like Bridge Over Trouble Water. Water. You did a live performance recent ishly of it. Maybe what? Maybe just the recording went up recently. And my goodness, that double A was beautiful. Oh, thanks, um, man. Uh, I've I've, I've played that, along with that live so oh. many times. I can imagine yeah. it's a not an easy one. I mean, nothing. None of your songs are easy. I don't know. Sometimes you'll do a, a whole thing. That's ridiculous. Um, okay, uh, I've lost my place again. Uh, we're gonna get some closing questions here. Pretty closing, I guess. Uh, this keep this one probably keep this one pretty quick because I don't know if there's too much saying it. Equipment wise, um, how would I think mouthpiece the trumpet? There's different maybe different importances. How important do you think like getting the right mouthpiece is? Like I think when I got the the T one point oh, you should all buy it. Um, when I got that, I think it was like, I think it really helped me. Um, as opposed to I was on the Bergeron before that, um, which was good. I played well on it, but like going to the T1.0 was like a noticeable difference of like sound and ease of playing. Yeah. 
Galaxy 1.0, baby. Um, <laughs> I, uh, Some say it works for everyone. Yeah, it works for everyone. No, it's just a cut. It's, 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 it's a fit. It's a fit, right? Yeah. Whatever gets you sounding closest to how you want to sound. And the other thing is, don't buy, I don't think anyway, don't buy into this attitude that you can try a mouthpiece for a while and learn to play it. Mm -hmm. I think it's nonsense, man. I think it's more like a, a shoe, you know. Well, no, that yeah. I guess shoe would shoe would that. No, that's a really bad analogy because you'd expect a shoe to mold to your foot after a while. It's more like put it on and. I don't have to be instant because one of the problems with choosing mouthpieces all the time is that you're sort of messing everything up every time you swap, you know, because yeah. yeah. the computer is having to recalibrate over and over and over again. But when one sticks and then you find that your sound's good on it and you've got a good register on it and the flexibility is okay, that's a good mouthpiece. Not, not much more than that. I feel a little bit um, targeted by myself for mouthpiece choosing stuff because I've created a monster that I have to keep up with my playing, like my, what I do. Created a monster hmm. that requires right on the edge of possible for me all the time. And so I don't have a a huge choice over the matter of mouthpieces. Yeah. In that I imagine a lot of people who are playing just sort of within the comfortable register of the instrument, they could play any mouthpiece and, yeah. and be a little bit more like, oh, this one just feels a bit better and this one this one feels better. For me it's like, <laughs> does it actually do what I need it to do? Yeah. And the yeah. answer is probably ninety nine percent of them is no. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So I'm, I'm kind of locked out of the market in that regard because if I need to keep doing what I'm doing, then I have to sort of play a particular one or yeah. a particular variant. Um, yeah, there's probably, I guess, if you're playing, I don't, I hate, I don't like talking about lead trumpet as it's like, or maybe range in particular, it's like different from everything else. But I guess if you're prob probably playing, you know, that high all the time, your market for what you can use goes down significantly. Yeah, I mean, there are some people that play big mouth, like Arturo plays a big yeah. mouth piece and can play really high and stuff like that, but it's still a sound thing, right? He doesn't mm -hmm. sound like me, I don't sound like him, and that's good, because we're not the same person. Yeah. Uh, but my sound is a combination of me, <laughs> the mouthpiece, and whatever trumpet I'm playing. Mm -hmm. Speaking of trumpet, how important do you think trumpet is? physical trumpet. yeah i think it's important i've been known to, i felt kind of unauthentic over the past while about all this trumpet malarkey hmm. um so i'm in the process of re re um finding rediscovering what my sound actually is hmm. Uh, without the judgment, w without allowing the judgment of others to interfere. So we'll see how that goes. But um, the Trump is massively important mm -hmm. from a color point of view. And some instruments have got just like, you know, you're guaranteed that sort of sound out of them, that quality. Um, so, yeah, I mean, Or you cut yeah, probably, out just for that well, second. Well, look at your favorite players, and you're probably going to play. You want to sound like them. You feel called you know, out? You're probably, probably going to play. 8335 LA? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're probably going to want to play like that. So, yeah. I don't know. That makes sense. I, yeah. It's kind of a generic answer, but. 
you know, there are other things like tuning and can you actually do... I always have like a double A test on a trumpet. Like I pick a trumpet up and if I can't play a double A on it, then it has to go back. Mm -hmm. It's probably an important... But that again is um, the same problem. It's a very specific issue. Yeah. Um, but maybe I just need to get better. <laughs> that's the, uh, sure that's, the, that's the other end of it. Maybe. Um, yeah. I think you're pretty good. Don't worry. Um, okay, uh, do you want to talk at all, um, I'm going to keep it a little quicker, because this is probably, you could probably talk about this for days. The process of creating your mouthpiece, was that like a, I don't think it was fast. Oh, yeah, it was great with Gary, yeah, it was just like, mm -hmm. it was crazy. Um, what's there to say? Um, um. I had like a six hour theory lesson with him about it all. And then we did the playing tests. Yeah. We did loads of playing tests and he kind of marked me on five or six other different mouthpieces, maybe nine, actually nine mouthpieces. Took all the things that he liked about those different ones and then put them into the computer, put the numbers in, lathed one off, gave it to me and, uh, yeah, it's perfect. So perfect. That wasn't, yeah, it's okay, hilarious. Awesome. I would love and what does this other one look, Gary? We spent eight hours on this. It's like, I've never had a plan B. Never got there. So, and he was right. Awesome. Sounds um, like a good experience. Very, very little, I got very, very little choice in the matter as well, which I think is great. <laughs> yeah, when I go to trumpet makers, good. when I go to trumpet makers, I want to be inspired by them, you know? Yeah. It shouldn't be a case of me trying to explain to them what they need to do. So, That's I want to be inspired. To He's the mouthpiece maker. Yeah, and nice. I trust him. Mm -hmm. So he makes some great mouthpieces. Oh, he does. Awesome. Um. So next question: If you had to relearn, I guess you know, I think you have some of your answers before. Maybe this doesn't make sense. Maybe it's better phrased: If you had to give advice to someone, it'd be like middle school, high school, and they're like just start like they want to learn how to play range. Not the trumpet, because that's a totally separate, huge can of worms. But just like range in general, would you have any advice for them? Any say? A piccolo trumpet, if you can. Mm -hmm. Spend a bit of time on the piccolo trumpet, and uh, and try and learn the trumpet top down, not bottom up. Mm. That's uh, that's a big one that we worked on is not con connecting yeah. upper register to lower register. Yeah, like. Um, try and do it with I mean tension try and do it with as little tension as you can but that's trying more that doesn't always work so yeah less tension I'd say tension. I, I can attest to that I had a lot of tension all throughout college yeah I, until I, I learned I how do. to play without it but, well not that I I still have tension but yeah working on the issues really really helped really it's hard it's important um, definitely Oh, you new trumpet players. No tension. <laughs> Just don't play with tension. It's that easy. Just don't play with tension. Yeah. Relax. Relax. <laughs> um, that all right, this uh, question that I've wondered, uh, I don't know if I've asked this before. Um, what's your favorite song that you like, you always get asked to play it? You know, maybe not always, but like when, when you're doing a guest artist, lead trumpet thing, what's your favorite song you get asked to play? you like, this is on there, you're like, I like this one. Excited. You hate all of them. No, I'm kidding. Uh, favorite one. It could be from your album. It could be something else, like you know, "Give It One" or maybe the "Gonna Fly." I do like to "Give It One." Into the Unknown is fun, but it's really hard. When you wish upon a star, one. I like playing because it's easy. <laughs> do me like it's that. usually the it's it was usually hard the break. it was hard for me <laughs> it's usually the break in the gig um uh right. that was part of the reasons i chose it for play it. <laughs> what's the <laughs> bridge over troubled water always has a vibe what oh bridge over troubled water it always has a vibe live it's good yeah and now N ness and dorma you'll hear it. it's um okay very cool live I don't like playing The Incredibles so much. And, um, mm -hmm. Is that a hard one? 
It's not that it's hard. It's just bitty and a bit sort of, you know. Yeah. What about Sing Sing Sing? It works. It works a lot better. I hate playing Sing Sing Sing. <laughs> it works a lot. It works a lot better in the studio than it does live. The Incredibles, in my opinion. I could I could see that. Seeing the video you posted versus <laughs> like maybe a live performance, both great, but I, it definitely has a different dynamic. Than it does like, yeah. in the studio. Definitely. Awesome. So yeah, into the unknown it always goes down the storm. Yeah, that's I remember. I have I have a friend, some people who don't play trumpet, don't listen to jazz, don't listen to like anything like that, and they heard into the unknown, and they're like, "You gotta send me this. That's awesome." <laughs> it's just it's it just, good. It's like rocking. That. Um, that's the last video we released until this next week. Kind of crazy. Hmm. True. Twenty twenty. It's a good one. Um. All right, we're about at the end here. Uh, you've answered this last question pretty thoroughly throughout the whole thing, but uh, I guess I don't have to ask it. The question is, where do you see your career going in the future? But I feel like you have talked on that a lot. I give you a pretty good answer to that. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> so here's here's the answer, and this isn't just trumpet. This is everything. And it's, I'd, I'd suggest everyone takes this analogy and applies it to whatever it is that they're doing. Now, when we're young and we're unaware and we're just kind of going through life, we're, we're sort of like a passenger on a boat, on a big cruise liner, we're just a passenger, and our life is like this. And we're just going down this path and and the the cruise ship moves over here and we start you know we blame everyone you know or oh i didn't get a choice over this matter i'm gonna just do this you know because i i've got to go to school i've got to do this and then you know your parents move house and then so you've got to go to this school instead and then kind of your passenger on the cruise ship of life and and um you're just reacting all the time to everything that's mm -hmm. going on and then at one point you gain enough awareness to realize that you have some control over stuff I and mean, when you can make some of your life the second level of consciousness would be called by me first one's to me second one's by me well you're still mm -hmm. kind of living like this but you're the captain of the ship now and you're you're choosing to point the ship in the direction that you want to the only problem is is that the water below you is changing and every single time that the water changes and it pulls the ship along you become fixated on whatever goal it is that you have and you try and steer the ship back to where you want to go and you become a bit of a control freak because you realize oh with this level of awareness that i can make something of my life it's kind of where i've been for about 10 years is mm -hmm. i've got to control it and i've got to pull this through here and the problem is you end up in super burnout because the because the ship is just like constantly against the water life is asking you to go this way you're going no i know better life is asking you to go that way you go no i know better and you're kind of forcing stuff all the time mm. and so then would you break through to the third level of awareness through me would be to actually be the water um and what ends up happening is your sense of awareness goes from this idea of what your life should or shouldn't be like to that yeah and this includes living in India for 40 years it includes going to the moon, it includes living to 120, it includes being a vegetarian when all you've eaten is meat, it includes uh, having 50,000 children, like er every possibility that there is in the quantum field is in this possibility. And when the water is pointing towards something, instead of resisting it, Instead of blaming someone for moving the water, you just go with it. And you simply observe life for what it is in that given moment. And you enjoy all of the possible opportunities that there are without concern of judgment or concern of what you think you should be trying to do in the world. It's very obvious to me to be a trumpet player, and maybe I should still be. I'm not planning on giving up. But I'm now open to the whole world 
and I'm open to seeing an opportunity, getting my head out of my phone, getting my head out of my life, getting the head out of everything that's going on, and going if my gut instinct feels good, not getting in the way of the computer and just going with it. So the answer to the question, where do you see your trumpet music career going in the future is, I don't. I'm not going to try and control it anymore. Um, mm. I'm not going to try and force outcomes. I'm simply going to go with the flow, as they would say. And I'm going to trust that in the pursuit of altruism, that I will be repaid in some sense. Um, a happy, comfortable life playing the trumpet, hopefully. But I'm, but I'm open, you know? I'm open to the, all the possibilities that there are out there now because it's so much more liberating knowing that we don't really have control over anything. Yeah. So don't bother. You know, it's too tiring. It's like mm-hmm. killed me in the last few years. So... um it sounds like I'm now being more lazy. It's not. It's like, actually, now my no, eyes are no. open. Yeah. I can actually see the possibilities. Whereas I would before have seen the op- opportunity was there and I would have made judgment on the opportunity and not been able to take it. right? Yeah. Because it wouldn't have aligned with my idea of what my life was supposed to be. So I don't know what's going to happen. And I'm kind of excited for that reason too. It's very exciting. Yeah. The new possibilities that there are. Um, so... Yeah, as a sort of philosophical answer at the end there, but it, it, I like it's it. where I, it's where everyone, <laughs> should, it's where everyone should be placing their attention. I agree. It's not fixating it on anything, um, and allowing opportunity to come into your life and being ready for the opportunity. You know. Yeah. Beautifully answered. I like it. Man. Good. Couldn't, couldn't have hoped for a better close. I think it was a good sum up of everything we've talked about. I like that. Yeah, um, well, it's, 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 it's what it's all about. So. Awesome. Uh, well, I think it's about the end of our uh, yeah. time here. Just an hour. Just kidding. Hour 48. Um, <laughs> any, any closing thoughts? Any plugs? Anything you want to say? I, Get off your chest. I think, we, I think we just about covered everything. There Probably. Is possibly be covered about anything. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, thanks Luke, for having me. I had a lovely, cha- lovely oh. time chatting. And yeah, we'll, always um, have always a blast talking. We'll no doubt have more chats in the future. It'll be good. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for coming. Thanks for joining me. For joining. I hope everyone watching enjoyed it. And uh, peace out. Have a great day. Don't control your life. You know. Don't bother. <laughs> Bye, everybody. <laughs>